Welcome to session C. This is biodiversity and human health. Uh, and if this happens to be the first session you're attending today, how this works is we've got uh, four speakers, 15 minutes a piece. Uh, we can allocate that 15 minutes however we want. And if uh, the speaker reaches their 15 minutes without having time for questions, we have a 30 minute question and answer session at the end with all the panelists. So um, if you don't get to ask your question right after their talk, just save it for the end. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our First speaker, we've got uh, Ben McHugh. He's the executive director of Outdoor Outreach, which is a San Diego-based youth development nonprofit that connects teens to the transformative power of the outdoors. So, thank you, Ben. Perfect, excellent. So, here we go. Speaking into the mic. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. It's, it's neat to be able to present something that it's not as a nonprofit organization based in San Diego. Our focus is not biodiversity, but it really is about the resilience of our human communities. And specifically, we do that through youth development. But I think there's a really strong connection. And I think today we've been hearing a bit about some of the key aspects of biodiversity and healthy ecosystems that can equally be applied to our human communities as well. Um, things like facing adversity, um, adaptation, and then the North Star that we have at Outdoor Outreach, which is building resilience um, so youth can face the, the challenges in their life successfully. So as an organization, we've been around for 20 years, um, and we're formed um, specifically to support youth and enable them to connect to this idea of possibility and opportunity in their lives. And so we work with youth across the San Diego region and we take them into the outdoors and connect them in meaningful ways to their environment, but then also to one another and to so positive supports in their community. And this is just an idea of some of the activities that we do across our region from surfing to rock climbing, stand up paddle boarding, environmental stewardship, civic engagement, um, on and on. And we have a lot of really strong partners with our land management agencies as well as with our local schools um, most recently, we've been partnering in an important way, and you'll hear in a little bit from another panelist, um, with the local children's hospital, Rady Children's Hospital, um, as well as with the San Diego County Probation Department to actually support youth in their juvenile detention facility and be able to take them outside into nature so that they can make positive connections that will then help them be resilient when they get out. And we actually, just this week, we had two probation officers share with us that they see a direct correlation with our program and a reduction in violence in their juvenile detention facility. And so I think there is a really strong connection with this idea of building resilience and how can you use a connection to the outdoors um, really to inspire change in communities. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of hope in that statement because I feel that the biggest threat that we face to biodiversity is really indifference. And how can you make people care about these spaces and it's really by enabling them to come into these spaces and find value on their own and connections that they'll sustain throughout their life. So just some few photos and we partner with about 40 different uh, youth service organizations and schools across San Diego County from the Monarch School which works with youth affected by homelessness to San Pasquale Academy up in North County um, working with kids in the foster youth system. And then we layer on um, also environmental stewardship. So we've seen directly that youth that now care about these spaces because they have a direct connection want to know what they can do to help protect them. And so everything from trash sorting um, to aquatic trash pickups um, in North County, um, working in community gardens um, to planting acorns um, in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Reserve. And we have a leadership program um, where we bring in youth that are juniors or seniors in high school, um, and we actually train them up to become paid instructors for outdoor outreach. And one of the things that we're most proud about is that over half of our paid instructor staff are graduates of our program and truly represent the communities in which we work and really are kind of the stewards, future stewards, present and future stewards of biodiversity and this idea of a strong connection um, to our ecosystems. And I just had lunch with Melly. Uh, she's one of our program graduates from 2017. 
Now she's a third year student at UC San Diego um, studying marine biology. And uh, Melly, through her own story, she, she saw Garibaldi for the first time with us out snorkeling at Mission Point. And that really instilled in her a, 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 this idea of awe and wonder and really a desire to study this. Um, but it's not just kind of the future scientists. We also have um, folks like G, who I'll introduce in a second, um, who are now uh, instructors for outdoor outreach and who are really paving the way for the next generation of outdoor outreach students and um, biodiversity advocates. So with that, I'll have G come up and talk to you a little bit about the program. It's a little too high for me. Hello? Hi. Um, well, as Ben just said, uh, my name is G, and I'm a leadership graduate and a field instructor with Outdoor Outreach. And a little bit more about my background, I was born and raised in uh, Mexico, and the only things I could remember from being back home, <laughs> I'm emotional, <laughs> um, is just waking up and fearing the unknown. <sighs> Um, not being able to know what my days were going to look like um, really scared, scared me. And um, four years ago, um, through a program at my school, I found Outdoor Reach. And Outdoor Reach, <laughs> sorry. Outdoor Outreach has been one of my biggest motivators for the past four years. I found my passion for the outdoors, and not only that, I also found a family that filled an empty space in my life. And <laughs> I remember one of the first trips I went on with Outdoor Outreach. Um, I was really, really scared of the fact of being outside. Um, I was scared of being on a kayak in the water or just climbing a rock that I never have seen before in the past. And Outdoor Outreach helped me to conquer my fears and also helped me find my passion for rock climbing and also just being in the outdoors. And Outdoor Outreach has been giving me different sources where I can connect with other youth like myself and I've been capable to create different connections where I can um, be their role model to encourage them and give them the opportunity to find their goals and be successful. And I remember a couple years ago back on a backpacking trip to the Sierras. Um, <laughs> um, on, on trip, uh, with in the Sierras, with Outdoor Outreach a couple years ago, I remember hitting a low point because before we left, I had a meeting with my lawyer telling me that um, my asylum case was going to take years and I just felt really overwhelmed and we were just huddling under the tarp, it was raining and I all these emotions just came and hit through at once. Um, but with the help of my peers and people that were around me from Outdoor Reach, I realized that we can help one another if we just stop thinking about the things we can't control. And even though I know that my um, legal status is going to take a while, I know that by being perseverant, perseverant I can um, succeed, and I can also be that role model for other people like me. And with Outdoor Reach, again, I found a family that filled an empty space in my life, and I, I don't know where I could be or what person I could be right now if it wasn't for Outdoor Reach. <sighs> um, another thing I wanted to say is, um, with Outdoor Reach, I discovered a lot of things. Like I found different people in different organizations where I'm also able to 
lead and guide trips for, and that just increased my love for the outdoors. And it has keeping it has been motivating me for the past couple of years to just be um, to be that person that gives hope to other people to accomplish accomplish their goals and not give up regarding the challenges they're facing. <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say, but uh, thank you all for listening. And now I'm just going to hand it to Sandy. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy. I am the senior director at Rady Children's Hospital. I'm an LCSW by trade. And I've spent the last 25 years of my career working with some of the sickest kids in the community, both from a medical and a behavioral health perspective. And in that work and in my plight to try to make a difference for, for the children in our community and seeing um, the escalation of issues for our kids in the mental health field, Today, um, suicide is the second leading cause of death for kids, and that's higher than any other medical diagnosis that you can imagine, and it's not well spoken of. So in our behavioral health services at Rady Children's Hospital, we believe there is no health without mental health. And in doing the work that we do, um, the clinicians are getting pretty burnt out because a lot of the kids that we're seeing are coming back in cyclically and not getting... Um, sort of a break from either their medical illness or their mental health illness. Their identity is becoming who they are getting services from. So if I'm a diabetic, I'll always be a diabetic. If I have um, cystic fibrosis and chronic pulmonary disease and I live every day with the threat of death, that's my identity. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do is create a different impact. And for me personally, it was this pursuit to try to find a connection to build identity for kids beyond their pathology, beyond their mental health diagnosis, beyond their um, medical diagnosis. And one of the ways in doing that was creating this partnership with Outdoor Outreach and trying to be able to help the kids have something either while they're in treatment or beyond treatment, to be able to say, you can be more than, you are more than and you have the ability to sustain yourself as more than. This is not who you are. And for all of you that have children, and for any of you that are helicopter parents, for kids with life-threatening illness and or chronic mental health illness, the natural propensity as a parent is to want to be overprotective. So giving these kids some sense of themselves to accomplish and achieve and be able to move forward and have goals and being able to show the parents or their extended family that they are more than and can be more than and be integrated back into the community. The idea of having outdoor outreach, and as, as G talked about, the incredible emotional impact and the growth and the development and the connectivity that this brings to our kids is so important. It's sustaining beyond a therapist. It's sustaining beyond treatment. It's sustaining beyond the medical field. So without that corp incorporation and partnership with, with our programs, we would not be able to help kids thrive. Um, we developed and have had cohort groups go through both from the medical and the mental health arena through Rady Children's and we refer our kids to outdoor outreach. Um, and I've also taken a step further and i um, now sitting on the board of Outdoor Outreach and it's been quite a privilege to be able to help grow and foster that, that connection and that, and that sense of um, well-being for our kids. But um, here's some of them cruising along. And the sense of connectivity. Um, we also live in an age, if you have teenagers, their entire identity is in their likes and their phone and their social media. And building that community sense of connected, connectiveness and having that group or that team that can hold them up, hold them up when they're given bad news and being able to be able to say, you've got a family, you've got a community, you've got a connection. That's lost in this generation of youth and that's where their resiliency is being stripped. So we're moving towards trying to come back to those basic things and giving them exposure. But to be able to say to that child who has was born with chronic illness and 
spends four or five days on dialysis at our hospital, where's the opportunity for them to go out and get in a kayak? Never. Where's the opportunity to go on a hike and do it safely? Never. But Outdoor Outreach has provided that opportunity for these kids. Um, we have reduced our mental health and depression and anxiety in our um, in our kids with chronic health issues and we've highly incentivized our kids who have mental health issues to see beyond they don't have to be the depressed kid at school they have a connection they can go with other kids that are experiencing the same thing and then go do something that is something beyond anything they've had exposure to so it's been an incredible gift and resource to all of us so i just wanted to share our partnership We probably have time for a quick question, unless uh, you want to just hold them until the question and answer session at the end. Just, okay, we'll do the latter. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Gary Bucciarelli. He is the Director of Research at the Stunt Ranch Santa Monica Mountains Reserve and an Assistant Adjunct Professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UCLA. Welcome, Gary. Well, thanks to the organizers for inviting me down from Los Angeles. Um, truthfully, I just got back from uh, New Zealand. The photo up here is uh, the city I was in. It was Dunedin, um, South Island, beautiful place. One of the things that was most striking about it is actually how much green space there is um, in the city. So what you're looking at here is uh, the middle of their city and looking out to the rest of it. Um, I did not Photoshop that bird in there. It just happened to fly. It's like, you know, that glorious down there. Um, <laughs> uh, so one thing to note is the green space, but they also have a very um, interesting, from my perspective, uh, kind of governance of uh, how species are managed on this, on this island. Okay, um, this is a place that had 32 endemic flightless birds um, and now have 16 species remaining. Um, so I say governance because what's also striking about it and very interesting for me is that they're very interested um, at the community level, making sure that um, non-native species don't get onto the island and established. Um, so you can juxtapose that green space with this space. Uh, this is home for me. Um, does anybody know where this is? What this is? It's a, it's a reservoir, it's Silver Lake. Uh, Silver Lake Reservoir. Um, and why I bring it up is because um, we like green spaces. Um, green spaces are great places to be. Um, but they also provide a ton of benefits too. So it's estimated that the 88,000 uh, square kilometers of space that is the greater Los Angeles area provides about uh, $85 billion in ecosystem services. Now those ecosystem services, you know, they're purifying air, they're filtering water, shade. It gets to be quite hot in LA. Um, so we, we like these green spaces, but they also do things for us, right? We benefit from these green spaces. And they're also just nice to take a stroll in, right? Um, the question I pose here is, what if that integral functioning, that ecosystem functioning, is compromised when we have introductions occur? And that's something that we really need to consider because... Um, losing those benefits can have health implications. And I'm gonna take you through a story. Um, it's based on some research, it's an ecological story. And um, if you have questions during it, if a slide's not clear, please just interrupt me, totally fine. So this green space, this is the Santa Monica Mountains. This is looking out to the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's about 157,000 acres of greenish space in the Los Angeles area. I say greenish space because it's actually a matrix, a mixture of privately owned land and 
uh, land owned by private entities and government entities, um, land trust agencies, national parks, uh, California state parks. And so um, it's actually the largest urban park, um, urban park in North America. And what you can see here is that the photo, I go back one, looks great. You're like, oh, it's beautiful. There's nothing around there. You're isolated, green space. You've hiked this amazing trail. You're up in the middle of this place, and it's fabulous. Well, just look at this topo map, and what you can see is that um, pretty much Los Angeles, the entire western part of it, is pinning in the mountains on one side. The San Fernando Valley, the Conejo Valley, the Oxnard Plain on the other side, and then you've kind of got Malibu running all along this. So you have all of these urban influences pushing into this 157,000 acres of greenish space. A central part of this ecosystem is really these streams. So this is in the Santa Monica Mountains. These are ephemeral streams, so meaning what they typically do is dry up um, past spring, right? They are not perennially running streams. We have perennial running streams in the system largely because of urban inputs, um, runoff from them. These streams tend to be highly species rich with uh, benthic macroinvertebrates, so those are the bugs that are on the stream bed, and amphibians. Um, this is their home. Um, we have a problem though, we have an introduction in these streams. Um, not all of them, I'm gonna show you how that looks, but it's the red swamp crayfish. Um, it's actually a globally invasive species. The blue on this global map shows you the original um, distribution of this species, where it evolved. Um, the red highlights where it has been introduced um, and this is from 2015, so it's actually spread a little bit further than these. Um, there are actually new introductions being documented um, each year. It's the main method of introduction is us. Um, they're typically used as bait, um, so that's one major problem. This is um, a map that shows Southern California, and these dots are showing you um, known observations from museum records or iNaturalist observations of where crayfish have been found. So, uh, San Diego, you've got some crayfish. Um, Los Angeles, we've got some crayfish. And I'm gonna focus in the Santa Monica Mountains area up in here. So why are these crayfish problematic and why am I talking about them? Well, aside from the fact that they are globally invasive, they're extremely, extremely challenging to manage. The only way to eradicate them, if at all eradicate, um, is through manual trapping. Um, they breed constantly throughout the year so they can have many breeding events within a season and produce thousands of offspring. Um, and normally that wouldn't be a problem because our streams dry up um, and they would not have habitat, but we have input that now makes it possible for them to persist in the environment. Um, they decimate amphibian populations. And when I say decimate, that's an understatement, really. I'm not trying to be sensational. Um, they will completely annihilate um, whole individuals. They're extremely aggressive. Um, they're omnivorous, so not only do they take out herpifauna in the streams, um, fish, but all of the um, plant communities in the streams are compromised. And Jared Diamond actually wrote a piece about crayfish introductions in the Los Angeles area, and he described them um, as A-bomb assaults on amphibians. Um, it's that tragical. So this is just a photo I put in there of us working in the stream. This is what we're doing when we're in the streams. This is kind of what the stream habitat looks like when we're working. We've found a newt, a California newt, trying to rescue it as best we can. Um, but we're out there collecting stream data, and we're also out there trapping crayfish. So this is a catch of crayfish from one net, 
one trap um, in 10 minutes. Yeah. We just bait it with a little bit of sardine or just sardine oil on some bread, and they flock to it. Um, and these are just the adults, so you have to remember there are juveniles, larvae in there. Um, so this is a map of our streams in the Santa Monica Mountains. And what's important here is to see that, yes, there is a, some streams we're not going to focus on. Uh, the yellow and the red are what we're going to focus on. And the yellow are streams where we don't have any crayfish. They're, they're not found there. And these red are crayfish streams. So the crayfish are in the red, and the yellow remain intact, okay, non-invaded, never invaded. And this map is depicting some work that came out of an amazing collaboration between uh, a few entities. Um, it was the USGS, it was Pepperdine University, it was UCLA, it was the UC Natural Reserve System, the Los Virginis Municipal Water District, and um, a land trust agency. We all came together and said, we need to do these surveys. We need to figure out what's going on with diversity in these streams and what's happening. So a huge effort to understand how ecosystem health was being compromised by crayfish, potentially. Um, so some of the results, and that's what this is showing you, this panel. The circle up there is showing you the abundances of mosquitoes as larvae and the native predator of those mosquito larvae, which are actually dragonfly nymphs. Um, and what you see is that in streams without crayfish, there are no mosquito larvae ever found in our surveys. Um, these are sampling methods that are done statewide. It's a recognized protocol. And you see about 35.6, so a, a pretty large amount of uh, these dragonfly nymphs in these streams without crayfish. You can compare that to the crayfish streams. So if you've got crayfish, you've got um, many more mosquito larvae and many fewer dragonfly predators. Um, so what, what does this mean? Why is this important? Why is this interesting? Um, it points to a potential role of native ecosystems, um, inherent ecosystem functioning, actually having huge benefits for us and health. Um, mosquitoes, um, huge disease vectors for humans. And why we want to pay attention to what mosquitoes are there and if they're actually getting eaten by native predators, the red um, genera, uh, 80s, Anopheles, and Culix are highlighted because those are the genera of uh, mosquitoes that are found in Southern California that have uh, human diseases uh, they vector, so including West Nile virus, dengue fever, yellow fever, um, encephalitis viruses like Zika. We don't have Zika here yet, but they can um, vector it. So we have 16 mosquito uh, species in total in Southern California, and these three genera represent um, the mosquitoes that uh, carry those diseases and vector them to humans. Uh, Culiceta is not a known carrier, and Oclerotatus um, is a carrier of canine heartworm virus. So what we really want to figure out is what's happening with these ecological interactions. Why in these streams do we see uh, tons of mosquito larvae where there are crayfish and what's happening with the dragonfly predator? And so we know that mosquito larvae get eaten by dragonfly larvae that dragonfly larvae get eaten by crayfish, but what we weren't clear about was what really happens with crayfish. Do they actually eat mosquito larvae? We were inclined to think not based on the survey data. And so what we set up was a set of experiments to try and understand what these ecological dynamics were like. And so what you're seeing on this uh, left graph here is the number of surviving mosquito larvae 
um, through time. So these are classic survival curves, right? And there's a control, you know, you gotta make sure your mosquitoes just aren't dying. So uh, we've got that taken care of. Um, and then you see that dragonflies are actually voracious predators of mosquito larvae. So they can basically take everything out that we put in there in a matter of 12 hours. So they're consuming uh, rapidly. Crayfish, not so much. And then here's the important part of this, which is when we put the two together, when we say what happens to the, the behavior of them and the feeding and the survival of mosquitoes when we put crayfish and dragonflies together, it's basically that the dragonflies have no impact. Their behavior, we found, was completely altered, and they become functionally non-existent. And that pretty much plays out in this graph, too. You can see that these, the proportion of surviving mosquito larvae, are essentially significantly the same um, and no different when there are crayfish alone or in the presence of the dragonflies. Um, and this is because not only do they alter their behavior, but they also just kill them, too. So it's a double whammy. Um, what happens next? Well, um, under future climate scenarios, and this is a very um, conservative scenario, um, both the vectors of human diseases, like Culex uh, species of mosquitoes, um, they're expected to expand their distribution as are crayfish. Um, the conditions just become so favorable for both of them to spread. So what you're seeing here are these red areas on this global map that show the expansion of mosquitoes into parts of the world that they've never been found before. And coincidentally, uh, crayfish tend to be right in parallel with that expansion as well. So just to conclude, I would say, uh, what can we do to maintain the integrity of our green uh, spaces and infrastructure? We're th thinking a lot about biodiversity and how we can benefit from it, um, and just being in it is important. There's that underlying mechanism, too, of making sure that the green space we have actually serves us from a health perspective as well. And I would argue that that means proper management, going into the design of these spaces, restoration goals that make sure um, natural ecological systems remain in place, using monitoring like environmental DNA to understand um, early detection possibilities and probabilities, um, and then community members, like working together and using apps and um, social organization platforms that allow you to share information with scientists and curators so we know what's there. Um, and with that, thank you for your time. Um, I think we're about up for that interval, so if you have questions for Gary, again, save them for the end. Uh, our next speaker had to step out and maybe came back. Christy, are you here? Hey, you're here. Uh, okay, Christy Orozco is the resource specialist at the Siquan Cultural Development for the Siquan Band of the Kumeyaay Nation and the principal of Native Plants and People. Hauka, mute moi, Christy Orozco, we nichuhi, mako bai, sampasqua. Thank you for um, inviting me here today, the museum. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. And today I wanna share um, some things I've learned and things I've learned from my elders and other people. I don't wanna be repetitive of a lot of the things that were talked about already so far today because a lot of the stuff I was gonna share was about the biodiversity of our region and we've heard a lot about that already today. So I'll try to um, skip over some of the things that we've heard this morning with the keynote speaker and so forth. This is my contact information, my website, and then this is, uh, we have a museum, and so I take care of the archives and curation there. So if anyone's interested in, um, it's free, open to the public. We do educational tours 
um, five days a week. So um, please reach out if you're interested. So I'm a member of the Kumeyaay Nation here in San Diego County. And San Diego County is um, really a blessed to have such the highest biodiverse county in the in the nation and second only to one county in Hawaii. So we're very thankful and lucky to have all the flora and fauna in our region that we are able to and it's also reflected in our culture. We have a very, very high um, level of diversity in our ethnobotany and that's reflected, um, in, like I said, in our culture, and it's very... Um, so here we talk about um, that California is considered, this area of California, one of the 25 most threatened uh, spots in the world. And um, also, this county has the most Indian reservations of any county in the nation. So we see here with the map, the biodiversity um, and uh, ecotypes. And so one thing that's important in our nation, um, traditional uh, ethnobotanical, from an ethnobotanical perspective, is that we have such a diverse um, uh, ecotypes in our, in, our, in our palette, I guess you could say. And so we have a traditional um, ways that we utilize uh, species from the desert to the mountains to the valleys, um, the watersheds, and then we have a rich, rich history with our marine, um, uh, all the marine resources, and then um, we have a lot of submerged and under underwater, um, and then also all the islands, the Channel Islands, um, we have a lot of ancestors there, and currently um, we don't um, get to uh, frequent the islands as we would like, and we'd like to to help with restoration projects. So we're working with the Navy and other municipalities to work on restorations. So we see here in our county, this directly affects me um, from an, a federally recognized Indian reservation. I've lived there my whole life. It's in the north part of the county, about an hour and a half, two hours from here. And so right now we're in the, we're in the central part of the Kumeyaay Nation. And so San Diego is a majority of um, the territory. And so we see just in 100 years the, um, that this is uh, development the impact of development is basically over the past 100 years. And so we still have opportunities to save some of the biodiversity that remains. And so we say, you know, we all feel, a lot of us, and, and I want to also, um, I didn't say it earlier, but thank all of you all for what you do and all your capacities, whatever, wherever you come from and whatever you do in your daily lives. I want to give thanks to all of you because it takes, you know, I know that um, all of us are here because we're concerned and we are working um, in, with our best efforts every day. So a lot of that comes from connections that we have personally or culturally or um, just um, ethically, what have you, beliefs that, that everything is related. And so uh, researching, you know, indigenous Lifeways, you see that connection to the environment is is integral. It's core. It's it's fundamental. And why is that? It's because when I go back to my elders, and I've found out is that that integral life force that connects us all it has been known, and it is known. And we just may not in this culture have the technology to uh, quantify it. But this is the energy life force and different ways that it manifests. And so us honoring that connection that we have to all creation is a lot of the basis for the energy that keeps us going together. And so these are some of the, um, the quotes that, that I grew up with that I wanted to share that I thought is important that we pass on to 
um, in an educational uh, perspective. And it's important also to, to remember that um, wherever, whatever part of the globe we're on, there is an indigenous people at that point on the globe. And there's an indigenous culture that's thrived. And those, that special endemic knowledge that's historical and um, thousands, in, in our culture, it's thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of years old, is our, 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 our teachings, our traditional teachings. And so these relationships with these species is a very, very deep and com complex relationship. And it, it's in our language when we describe a word or a, a feature or a, a eco, eco type or a landscape, sometimes the words can describe the properties in that landscape or some of the, um, but if the language is not explored, the, the traditional people are not um, valued for their knowledge, the elders, we're at the point in this part of the country that there's the last of the people that were here when um, before contact. So they were learned from the last of um, the before contact of any. So there's so much knowledge there of because the West Coast has a very particular history with that. So it's important to document wherever you're at when possible, what you're working with, and maybe how some indigenous people may interpret or may utilize or may um, interact with those resources that you're interacting with. And there's something to be learned in all cases. And it may help deepen your research and your, and your, and your um, interaction with your programs. So we see here in the North America, we see the red is spots of high biodiversity in the country. So you see that um, in other areas, uh, it, you know, that, that there's very few um, red spots in California has, and Hawaii have the most. And so I relate this to cultural diversity um, hot spots as well. So if you see here in California, here we are, Ipai, Tipai, that's us, Kumiai. And so you see the density of, of linguistic stocks. And over here as well, you see on the East Coast the density of linguistic stocks in here as well. So you go back and you see a little parallel. And then you go and you look at an ancient archaeological sites maps. Here in San Diego, we have a very, very old site, 150,000 years. It's actually on an exhibit upstairs in the Natural History Museum. And it shows human interaction with mammoth bones. And it's been dated between 130 to 160,000 years old, give or take. I, I might be off by. Ten there, but uh, anyhow, the point being is that that was a that's an an archaeological paleoarchaeological site here in San Diego County in Santee, 150,000 years old human habitation. That that to me, I have I'm still researching to find to to disprove myself, but that makes San Diego the oldest continually inhabited place on Earth, because although there's older archaeological sites, there's not any that have remained non-desertified at that age. And San Diego has maintained a culture of, and we, we, are, we come from a linguistic stock called the Hokan, which is an ancient, ancient people. And it's been, um, I don't know if anybody studies um, world cultures and, and, and people's origins, but uh, it's a haploid B DNA, meta, meta DNA, and that still, is not fully explained, and it, we believe it's because our Kumiai way says that life began here. So we have um, 
these sites that are ancient, ancient sites, and those also go back and have some parallels to the biodiversity hotspots in the Amazon and the Peruvian and here in North America and so forth. So I wanted to show those things because that's something that I'm researching and continuing to add to the information to show those parallels. I know it to be true here, so I'm working with others to, to show the parallels. I know it to be true in Hawaii. So. So how do I um, how do I create my uh, reference documents to to back up what I'm trying to say here? So, as I said, upstairs is the exhibit that talks about the ethno history of Southern California, and it actually is causing a lot of sites to be re-examined. A lot of uh, paleontologists and archaeologists are saying, "Wait, you know." I said this out in the field, but nobody believed me at that age that something like this could be happening. So now a lot of sites are being re-examined. And why is that important? That shows that this, this area has been ecologically viable and to, to, to populate human habitation for that long. That means it's a sustainable, sustainable lifeways, sustainable cultures that have been um, interacting with the environment. And how do we know that? Um, Dr. Sasan, he also works here for the Natural History Museum, and he did a really fantastic study of one of our, of one of our archaeological sites called Ishtagua. And Ishtagua, they didn't even go down to the bottom of the charcoal formations, but they, the last charcoal um, date was at 40 plus thousand years old. And this is located here, um, just not far from here. And uh, so Dr. Sasan was, is the zoological, he's the, what's his title? Well, he's the um, zoological, he works here at the zoological Arc, uh, laboratory here, anyhow. So I don't know his title, sorry. But um, so he did this study and he, he yielded like 100 animal species um, per site. And he, was, he studied many other sites and he says this is a remarkable array of species reflecting the utilization of diverse marine and terrestrial habitats and a broad spectrum diet and focusing on um, a diverse amount of, of animals and, and it's, what it what it was is it's a it's a example of the harvesting methodologies that were utilized to create a sustainable environment and a, a sustainable culture for the Kumeyaay Nation for the Kumeyaay people over tens of thousands of years of interaction. So that's what we're seeing there, and the 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 ability to have a broad spectrum diet was an advanced technology so that it could be a sustainable and uh, sustainable life way. There are many, many um, traditional foods that take, it's very complicated and very chemically um, sensitive to prepare and you have to be, um, and it's, it's very, um, so we know that those kinds of uh, activities and, and, and discoveries of utilizing different chemical compounds is uh, something that is very advanced and learned over time. So it's important to, um, to honor those, those, that knowledge of, and, that, and those resources. And um, so now the Southern California indigenous diet is being hailed as one of the most optimum diets known to man and one of the most optimum life ways known California Indians because of the, they call it um, somewhat of like a paleo diet and so it's based on a lot of seeds, nuts and berries and, um, and, and shellfish for our, for our community here and so forth and so now people are realizing that this is the best kind of diet for people. And this is also further um, seen when we talk about uh, the health of people now. So you look at the health of people with indigenous um, 
uh, ancestry, and a lot of times they can't process, um, their bodies don't process, process foods well, right? So you get, in our community, high rates of diabetes, and different other ailments, heart, heart and, and different things. And it's because we're not um, sticking to our traditional foods. We don't, we don't have access and we're not incorporating the traditional diet into our daily lifestyle. And so what I try to do also with, um, at my work and, and um, with the website is to talk about how we can do that little by little, incorporate traditional foods back into our diets, whatever, whatever um, traditional roots we have around the globe, all of us can incorporate those back into our diets so that we can start getting that balance back with our own bodies. And for instance, here, I'm trying to assist with um, getting blends, tea, tea blends like kumiai teas, so that we can increase the health of elders and other people that are suffering from like diabetes and different things like that. So, um, so we see here now we're learning that all these traditional philosophies are a reflection of what's really going on in our biospheres. And we're learning that the under, underground um, components are really actually um, increasing root surface area by 70%. So it's really important to have the correct um, companion species with the, your microorganisms and with your companion species because they've evolved together, the microorganisms and the native plants. So there's a couple thoughts, ending thoughts there. Um, saving cultural diversity also helps save biodiversity because, and um, there's also, uh, you know, people say that you can't solve problems with the same thinking that created them. So it's up to people like us with um, creative ways of thinking to help create new solutions for um, the next generation so that they have um, more positive paths to, to these solutions. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Christy. Again, if you have questions for Christy, just save them till the end. All right. I'm going to try and wield both the microphone and this laser pointer at the same time so I don't have to stand still. If this is bothering you, let me know. Um, so I'm Steve Kabiski. I'm a scientist at the San Diego Zoo, uh, the Institute for Conservation Research, and I work in a group called Disease Investigations. Uh, just from my perspective on this, I'm not a public health official or a human physician. I'm a veterinarian. Uh, as a pathologist, I do uh, diagnostic work for the zoo and the safari park, as well as some field conservation programs. And my research interests are largely in virology, in discovering new viruses and characterizing diseases that they cause. All the viruses I've contributed to discovering lately or have all been really boring and do nothing. So I'm hoping for that big break where I discover something like the new Ebola virus or something. <laughs> Um, and I will say that while this is based on human health, I am very interested in diseases that are transmitted between humans and animals, but my passion is in wildlife conservation and understanding infectious diseases so that we can mitigate uh, their effect on threatened and endangered species. Uh, this is a really simple definition of biodiversity for a pretty incredibly complex concept, uh, the variety of life in the world or in a particular habitat or ecosystem. And when I think of biodiversity or biodiversity loss, I basically default to thinking about animals. Uh, I think about uh, the loss of a species at some trophic level and how that affects uh, animals at other trophic levels. And I was gonna use some example, but honestly, I think the, the crayfish and dragonfly example is perfect. Um, you get affect some predator of mosquitoes and you get an abundance of mosquitoes and you link that to human health by mosquitoes carry lots of diseases. You think about something that preys on rodents and the rodent prol or rodents will proliferate, rodents carry lots of diseases too. Uh, if you're in a really populous area or say a touristy area where people are always feeding rodents, the chances that uh, a disease can be transmitted from an animal to a human is increased. In reality, these food chains are a lot more complicated than more like giant food webs. And in actual reality, this is probably a hell of a lot more complicated than this. Uh, if you were at the keynote address this morning, um, 
in, as complicated as that was, it was basically just on plants, and he took into consideration the climate and weather and rainfall and sunshine, and you'd really have to uh, incorporate all of that into these pathways to get a full understanding of the complexity. And I do think that in the near future, biodiversity research will, uh, with the technology we have on data analytics, you'll be able to take uh, smaller subsets of these networks and even combinations of these networks uh, and analyze them and see how alterations in those may end up affecting humans negatively. One thing I did come across when researching this talk um, is the emphasis of a healthy ecosystem as like a service to people. It's a service to us. It says at least 40% of the world's economy and 80% of the needs of the poor are derived from biological resources. And two really interesting examples I came across, one was biomimicry. So if you're familiar with biomimicry, it's basically modeling structures and products after the really exquisite adaptations of the natural world. And a really interesting example that I came across watching a talk um, from a researcher at a biomimicry institute was there's a species of shark whose denticles of its skin are arranged in a way that's really not conducive to bacterial growth. And so they're talking about making these coatings to use in hospital surfaces that bacteria just won't grow on. And if you think of the number of infections that occur in this country and other countries that are acquired from hospitals, that'd be a huge feat for public health. The other is drugs, of course. I, forgot the statistic, but there's a huge number of pharmaceutical products that we use today that are derived from natural or biological products. Modern antibiotics came from a fungus. There's a really widely used chemotherapeutic agent that comes from a chemical compound found in the sap of a, of a tree in the Pacific Northwest. And if you just imagine the number of chemical compounds out there that we've yet to discover that may have therapeutic benefit, it, it's mind blowing. And the good thing too, again with technology, is that we could probably discover those compounds, study them, and synthesize them in a lab without having to overexplore the natural resource. Uh, another angle of research on biodiversity, which is, which is pretty exciting, um, is it's just massive socioeconomic and political implications. I saw a talk from a researcher at Berkeley uh, named Justin Prashares, who specializes in this, and he used overfishing as an example. Uh, and obviously, overfishing is a really huge problem. Um, to fisheries all over the world. Uh, they have the potential to cause collapse of entire aquatic ecosystems if we keep it up in this unsustainable way. And that's obviously bad for the fish, it's bad for the ocean, it's bad for other species that depend on that ecosystem, but it's also bad for communities of people who also rely on the fish that cannot compete with those giant fleets. And what happens when you have these people that can't compete with commercial fishing fleets is they're driven into the bush to try and get alternate sources of protein. Uh, and this is a really big problem. It creates yet another conflict between humans and wildlife, aside from the exotic pet trade and aside from poaching for ornaments and traditional medicine. And this is almost a necessity. What are you going to tell these people? To starve? But I do want to dive a little deeper into wildlife as food because um, it's relevant to a a pretty timely example that I wanted to go into, and that's uh, emerging zoonotic diseases, particularly those that come from wildlife. And the term zoonotic disease or zoonosis just refers to a, a disease that can be transmitted from animals to humans. So just a show of hands of people that are aware of this situation right now. I'm assuming most people, okay, good. And if you don't mind me asking a show of hands of people that actually have like a legitimate concern that they may be affected by this virus in San Diego. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm not, if that makes you feel any better. But, yeah. Watch, I'll be the only one that ends up dying from it. <laughs> uh, I don't have a lot of time to talk about viruses in general, but I do want to give a quick background. Uh, this coronavirus is a beta coronavirus, and beta coronaviruses tend to circulate among bats. Humans, pigs, dogs, cats, mice, we all have coronaviruses that circulate in our populations, usually causing fairly mild disease. Uh, we don't know if this coronavirus can go directly from uh, bats to humans or if, or if other coronaviruses do, but right now we're dealing with a novel coronavirus that is causing an emerging disease of people. And emerging, the term emerging disease just sounds exactly what it was. It's, it was not a thing and now it is. HIV is a really classic emerging disease that is now endemic. Uh, the term novel just refers to it's a new virus. So. You may hear about scientists discovering new species of frog in the rainforest or a new insect. Uh, it's not like those species just materialize, we just hadn't found them yet. And the same is true for some infectious diseases. There's, there's lots of things we just haven't found because we haven't looked. But with the case of a novel virus, these truly have become 
um, so different genetically that they're classified as new or a different strain or a different species by acquiring such dramatic genetic changes. One of the ways that they get these dramatic changes is through something called viral recombination, and it's basically the closest thing a virus can come to sex. You can have two viral strains that infect the same cell, and as they're dividing and replicating in that cell, they sort of swap genetic material. And what's produced are these viral progeny that are basically hybrids or recombinant strains of that virus. So as an example, uh, the previous coronavirus outbreak, which was the SARS coronavirus in 2003, is thought to have come from two different strains of coronavirus from bats. It underwent a recombination event. This recombinant strain was able to jump species and infect this palm civet, which is a little mongoose-like animal, and then a human was exposed to an infected palm civet at a market. And in the current situation as well, there is a market implicated as the point source of infection for this novel coronavirus we're dealing with now. Uh, it is, probably came from a bat uh, because it's a recombinant strain, but we don't know if there if it was direct bat to human or if there's some intermediate animal like the palm civet was for the SARS outbreak. Uh, <clears throat> so this was a seafood market, but by all accounts, there was lots more than seafood there. Uh, there's often both live and dead animals being sold, seafood, domestic animals, and probably from credible sources, upwards of 50 species of wildlife there. So these markets can contribute to disease uh, in several ways, and it may be kind of intuitive, but I just want to go a little bit into detail. Uh, basically, you've got a lot of animals in cages, right? They're, they're in abnormal stocking densities. They're nose-to-nose, -nose, just simply from physical proximity makes it more likely that they're going to be able to transmit infectious diseases between them. You've also got species of animals next to completely different species. You may have chickens and ducks next to each other, next to cats and snakes and bats and other mammals, including primates, which is not obviously a, a natural situation. This is usually very stressful for animals. Stress weakens the immune system. If you bring an infected animal already into that situation, they're just much more infectious. Every droplet that they sneeze or cough or every bit of diarrhea that they have is gonna be much more highly infectious to anything else that becomes exposed to it. And by the exact same token, uh, an uninfected animal is going to be a lot more susceptible to becoming infected for all of those reasons. So these situations are just breeding grounds for, um, they're just basically fueling the drivers of, of emergence of new viruses. If you can imagine different species infected with different things, the chances that they're gonna become infected with two different strains and there's gonna be a recombination event is fairly high. And then what do we do in these market situations? We add droves of people, right? And if you're, if you're walking through one of these markets with a surgical mask on just to stroll, that's one thing, but the point of these markets is to show up and eat, right? So. A lot of animals are also butchered on site, so there's also blood and tissue and other highly infectious material. And it just creates really, really intimate contact of people with infected material, highly infectious material. Um, and I just wanna, just because I'm a wildlife guy, I have to kind of circle back around away from people and say that this, this kind of situation occurs in the wild. It's not as intense as maybe a wildlife market or a live market, but we are constantly plowing over wild lands in these really richly biodiverse areas. And what happens when we're, when, we're, when we're encroaching on animals is we're pushing them closer and closer to each other, to members of their own species. They're being coming closer to members of different species. They're competing for limited resources. They're stressed out, increased susceptibility, increased transmissibility of diseases. And it's, again, just driving um, those things that cause viruses and other pathogens to emerge. And again, we put people right here. They're going to end up existing right at these interfaces that they created. Uh, and with people come livestock and pets and everything else that can become susceptible. So I, I will say that I don't know how, what the death toll is from this coronavirus. Now it seems to change every time I check my, my phone. I tried to check right before we came in here, and the top story was something about Jessica Simpson wishing she had a prenup when she married Nick Lachey. So that wasn't very <laughs> helpful. But... Um, even if it kills thousands of people, that would be very unfortunate, but it would not be a blip in, in the seven billion people, right? The human population will be fine. A lot of the animal populations that exist at these interfaces will not be fine if they suffer uh, an infectious disease outbreak. Uh, I, I wanted to delete this slide just because it's kind of busy, um, but I had to turn this talk in two days ago and I didn't have time. 
Um, so just kind of uh, blur your eyes and focus on the pretty colors. But basically, the point of it is to wrap up and say this is a fairly quick and dirty um, explanation of a lot of complex things. The point of this slide is just to show the interconnectedness between diseases that are shared among wildlife, humans, and domestic animals, and all the various things that, that drive that connectedness. And I think at the center truly is biodiversity, and as such, biodiversity loss is at the center. And it can have a really dramatic impact on this dynamic. And despite the the relevance and the severity of it, uh, just one of those examples is the potential emergence of, of pandemic viruses. So um, I want to implore people, uh, there's lots of news, it, it's hard to keep up with just because the situation changes so quickly, but if you're looking for accurate um, updates, uh, really easy to read FAQs, the CDC's website and the World Health Organization uh, are really good resources um, for learning about the latest in the spread uh, of this virus. Um, so I don't know how much time I had, but <laughs> either way, I'm the last speaker, so I think we can, oops, I didn't even set the timer. Hopefully I didn't go over. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have uh, about 25 minutes. I will invite uh, the rest of the panelists up to the front, and um, I guess we can either pass the microphone to people to ask questions or um, ask the people who are fielding the questions to make sure they repeat the question into the microphone for the camera. I'll do whatever everyone votes on, I guess. Thank you. I don't know, Allison, if you heard the questions, wondering if San Diego Zoo is involved in any um, advocacy for trying to crack down on wildlife trade. Uh, we definitely have initiatives at the San Diego Zoo based on wildlife trafficking. So I think there's going to be more and more research and more and more involvement we have. I think this situation is maybe just a little too new um, for us to be directly involved. But I, I do know that there is increasingly calls for these markets to be a little more regulated in the way of, of wildlife. Uh, there was some crackdown after the SARS outbreak. Um, it's just really kind of a deeply cultural practice out there, so I, th I think it's a long road um, if there's going to be serious crackdown of that. Um, but I can I can try and find out how how and if we would be involved. So I think <clears throat> to summarize the question is, is how are we going to get um, more people involved and how intricately connected human health is to biodiversity because it does seem like a fairly new field and it seems like there's a lot of interested people in this group but we represent a very small percentage of the population. Um, and honestly, I think I'm going to give this, yeah. Sure, so I think uh, that's a great question. I think you need to make your voice heard is the number one. And, and before I came to Outdoor Outreach, I worked for a, a binational conservation organization for eight years and trying to talk to a lot of decision makers on both sides of the border about the value of things like biodiversity and having some of them tell me, my constituents really don't care about that. They care about jobs, they care about health. Um, and so I think elevating these issues to that level um, is one way to kind of ramp it up the priority. And so one thing right now, for instance with Prop 64, which is the cannabis tax, um, they've actually put in many millions of dollars into the cannabis tax to actually um, give to the Natural Resources Agency for the state of California, um, specifically for early intervention programs for youth in the outdoors. That's the first of its kind ever type of a grant program to come out of the Natural Resource Agency. And so I think, and that came from groups like Outdoor Outreach going up to Sacramento and talking to them about that connection between health and the environment. I also think with our existing programs, the things that we do, we have to ensure that we have evidence-based quality outcomes so that they're measurable and that we're able to then provide that and, and elevate that up and use that as an advocacy tool. Without that, it's very subjective. And like Ben says, well, we're not interested in that. doesn't hit my cord, doesn't hit my string. So linking anything we do should have those outcome measures in there. Yeah, I, I would just add that Heather Tallis, who is a research scientist, she now works with the Nature Conservancy. She's actually done a huge amount of research um, to understand the impacts that green space has upon a student's ability to learn. And there is pure evidence 
from this empirical body of research that when a student is exposed to greener spaces, they learn better. Um, so I think for a lot of communities in California, the two hottest items are jobs and housing. And how do you get a good job? You get a good education. And how do you get a good education? You experience green spaces. One of my capstone projects was to show the parallel between uh, environmental education and educational awareness in the community. And there's a direct link between providing educational outreach and, and environmental education to youth and their environmental awareness as they become adults. And so pushing environmental education any way possible and I know that's what majority of us do here, so I just want to say thank you for all of us doing that because it's a exponential cycle, and by doing that, we're, we're ensuring that there's more people that are environmentally aware. So the question is, uh, can we recommend any resources for people to get more involved with, with some of the stuff we're talking about today? I know you do. <laughs> I mean, I think for, for folks that are interested on, um, you know, we, we do, we have a paid staff that run all of our programs, but we also rely on volunteers, people that can help open those doors to those outdoor spaces. Oftentimes, bringing kids to those spaces for the first time, it can be incredibly scary and intimidating, and just having someone there with them, they don't even have to go in the ocean if it's their first time there, but having someone to be there at the beach with them um, can really increase their ability to find value in that experience that then would be carried on. Um, and especially having a diversity of folks come out as volunteers for us is incredibly valuable. Um, I would suggest to all of us as individuals is to, you know, take the courage to speak up more for these, for these things that we're all talking about here, not just once a, a year at this symposium, but every day in our everyday life and, and, and reflect that in our actions and our choices, because as we know, as you know, in this consumer society, our dollar talks, right, and and is our vote and so forth. And and so, um, I would encourage all of us to um, be more bold and courageous in speaking up for the resources. We are one species that is gifted with a voice, and so it's our responsibility to speak up for our relatives. All these animals and species and plants and environments and ecosystems is, is we're all connected. And so it's important that we just be who we are and speak up more and, 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 and share, share what we learn and share with other people constantly because that's how we're gonna grow this awareness. Yeah, so the question was, does anyone have any experience with making an impact on adults, because I think everyone's making a good point as we really need to get this out early. I think it makes a huge impact when you can educate children in this way, but um, how do you educate adults? And I mean, honestly, from my perspective, I, I work in, in a large conservation organization that has lots of educational activity going on and lots of charismatic animals to look at. Uh, and I walk around the zoo or the safari park and I hear people being pretty inspired by something they've never seen before. You know, it's not like most people are gonna be able to see an elephant in the wild in their lifetime or any other of these species in the wild in their lifetime. And I'm surprised at how many times I've heard somebody just be blown away by something they're looking at in a zoo. And that's just a very simple example, but it's the one that, that I'm coming from. Um, and honestly, forums like this, fora like this, um, I, I learned a long time ago that, that hardcore science isn't much without being able to engage communities and educate people. Um, so the more people that attend these, I mean, I think everyone in this room is an adult, so hopefully they're you know, paying attention and, and learning something from it. Um, it's hard to communicate science to, to a, such a diverse audience, um, but uh, I do think these things are really valuable. So things like this are, are one way. Sorry, uh, I read an article that um, speaks to, I think, your question in my master's program. And they had a project down in Costa Rica where they had a school program, and then they measured the amount of information um, that the kids disseminated to circles around them further and further. So they measured their parents, you know, the people that live in their same home, their neighbors, 
um, but then also strangers. And so, sorry, um, they measured that information then as far out as strangers, and they actually saw that they were disseminating the information. So I think a lot of people think that education for kids is too slow, um, but it's not, and they do disseminate that information out to adults. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I would love a crawfish boil, personally. I think if the students of Pepperdine were able to set it up on Pacific Coast Highway, they'd be funded for life. But the question is, uh, you know, there was an idea that if you can't beat these introduced invasive species, eat them, right? Turn them into food. And it's worked in some systems. Um, there are lionfish. There are other instances where it's been successful. Um, we have not tried that, um, mostly because we've done some testing and determined that they bioaccumulate heavy metals. Um, so it would be a very bad endeavor to consume <laughs> these. Um, but it's a brilliant idea. What actually happened, because what I didn't share with you is there was a collaborative effort where we removed, oh, 750,000 crayfish in one season from just uh, two uh, mile stretches of streams that I showed you. Um, where do they all go? They actually go to a wildlife rescue center and birds and raccoons and other animals that are in need of food. It mitigates the cost to rehab those animals. So um, they would consume them like raccoons. They would naturally eat crayfish, so it works. Um, so there is a win-win at some level. Um, but for humans, not, not an option for, for protein. Sorry. <laughs> I grew up in Georgia where they do real crawfish broils. I went to one out here and there was like brie and chardonnay and I was like, no, this is, this is not a crawfish boil, so. In the Gulf states, yeah. So the question is, well, these crayfish are in like the southern parts of the United States where they've been consumed uh, in great delication for many, many, many generations. Um, what happens there? Um, there's an idea in evolutionary biology that um, where you have these species in their native ranges, they've evolved with native predators. Um, that's what's happening in the south there. They have native predators that can move through those systems and consume them. And we don't have a functional equivalent in our system. We have a huge amount of biodiversity. It's awesome. We love it, right? Um, but we don't have a predator. And where it becomes even more problematic is the pressure they apply down through the trophic levels where they start consuming plants, invertebrates, amphibians. Um, and so there's nothing really above. It would be like fish, right? Like big mouth bass would be a great predator of them. And interesting side story, we did a restoration project at a golf course that had introduced um, fish in these massive, massive ponds. And they had crayfish too. But what we found is that the crayfish numbers were completely depressed relative to the stream that it flowed down into because there were no fish in those streams below. The stream was pretty much natural otherwise, aside from the crayfish. Great question. We have about five minutes if you want to keep. Yeah. Um, as far as kind of emerging diseases or threats? Uh, emerging diseases or, or threats outside of the zoo, like the plague that we have here now and some animals, uh, the hantavirus, is that something that 
it's kind of monitored or is that kind of a big issue? Yes, the question is uh, about some of the more local infectious diseases we have that can be diseases of humans, specifically mentioned plague, which is caused by a bacteria, and then hantavirus, uh, which is a virus carried by deer mice. And um, actually, there's, a, there's an annual report, the San Diego Compendium for Communicable Diseases, that will outline uh, the prevalence and incidence of all these uh, major diseases, lots of which come from animals. I think both of those are exceedingly rare in people. Um, hantavirus infections, I, I can't. I can't think of one recent, and I can't think of a plague. I know the squirrels carry around plague, and I know deer mice have hantavirus, but no, no, I don't think so. I don't even think um, any of those get ill from those carrying those pathogens around, which is often the case with vectors of those diseases. They don't, they're not really affected by them themselves. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. And at the bottom it says something like a eighty-five billion dollars. Value. Yeah. I, I didn't understand what that meant and where it came. Yes. Yeah, so what I was relaying there is that the Greater Los Angeles area, if you take the total uh, square kilometer space that it is, eighty-eight thousand, um, that's the estimated dollar value that's provided by the green infrastructure in that whole region, um, and that would take into account. Um, air quality, uh, water purification, shade to cool buildings. Um, those are all green infrastructure uh, services. Yeah, it's based off of a paper um, by Elmquist in 2015 where they actually put monetary values on all of those things from shade to water filtration to air filtering, etc. Yeah. It's a great paper. I can share it with you if you want. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Can I bring another question? Oh, I was, sorry. Yeah, sorry. We'll go sorry. in the back and then. So the question is, how do we remain sane in the face of all these threats to our own health? Um, I'm pretty careless about my own personal biosecurity, so that's, that's how I do it. Um, you know, I, I have pretty, uh, pretty constant exposure to potential infectious diseases. I, I, I work with live and, and dead animals, wildlife. Um, I, I do agree that it's kind of depressing when you start talking about the loss of wild species and wild lands. and. It's kind of hard to find success stories, but if you look, you will. Um, and it's all about changing public perception. I, you're never going to just have someone knock a door down and say, okay, this has to stop. It just takes years of legislation and um, public perception changes. And I guess I have some kind of hope in that. Um, like hearing these stories, these inspirational young people come and talk about how profoundly affected they were by just being in the outdoors and, and participating in these, I mean, you, you get more people involved in that and I think that that children of the future right we've been told that for a long time it's true or you just don't think about it does anybody else want to I, th I think it's really really important for people doing this work to remind yourself on a regular basis of why you care so I mean make sure you're taking time for yourself to go out there and connect at a deep level with those that you love to the outdoors to, and remind yourself why you're even doing this Right, because in a lot of cases, I think it does seem like an uphill, an uphill battle. Um, and I think I'm I'm really reminded by you know all the young people that we work with, and every time I can get out of the office and connect with them, I'm reminded in an instant why all of this matters. So that's what I would say. Therapy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, I think the biggest thing is what Ben's saying is connecting yourself to whatever mission and defining what your mission is and why you do it every day. Um, some people, somebody once said to me, it's okay to walk away and say, not my monkeys, not my circus. 
Um, and there's some days where you say that, and there's other days where you step in and say, these are my monkeys and this is my circus. And being able to have the opportunity and the privilege to be able to do that, I think is also something that, um, if you're capable and willing, it's a gift to be able to do that. So I think it's a framework, a perspective, and then just finding the balance that's been talked about. Um, I think that from adding on from what they both said, I think uh, that just being um, or appreciating what we have, because as Ben and um, you already said, uh, we have the opportunity to be able to go to all these places and change people's minds, but we also have to consider how much we appreciate the situations that where we are because not everyone has those same situations and we all have the privilege to just be able to go outside or anywhere where you go and change other people's minds. Uh, I think that, well, with my ethnobotany background, I've always researched different um, plants and, and I was taught and working with these resources that um, you have to take care of yourself because like like you're feeling that 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 weight sometimes you don't want to carry that back to your family and um, with some of the the issues that we have to deal with um, and so I think that um, learning as much as we can about the benefits of the at the of the natural world um, such as like some of the ethnobotanical benefits from our just what we can have in our yard and things that can help us on a daily basis and connecting with um, our space, our personal space. And also um, there's healing properties in the soil and working your own personal garden, whether it be just a plant in your window or whether it be a nice um, garden that you cultivate, there's multiple, multiple benefits. And there's also uh, uh, beneficial bacteria that grow in the soil that have antidepressant properties and they're released when you work with the land. So these are all things that we can research more that have to do with our locality and our specific um, you know, uh, positions wherever you're at and whatever you do and how you can um, expand on those things in your environment or in your workplace or home place so that other people can be aware and, and then they can start to benefit as well. Oh, sorry. Um, so my question is directed at, at G, and it's uh, this, the last conversation was a good segue into it. Um, we're hearing a lot about the youth and how they're disseminating information, and, and you're out there and you're working with other youth. And, and um, so just as, a, as, I guess, maybe a final question, what is something that you're looking forward to doing in the great outdoors, whether it's part of outdoor outreach or your, your own um, adventures? Uh, working in this this very biodiversity um, hotspot. Um, I think that that's a question that I think of a lot of times throughout uh, my week, my days, or whenever I'm working. Um, and I think that my main goal is to actually make an impact on other people and also be able to expand so that I'm not the only person making the impact, but also other people that I have, I have inspired by doing what I like doing. All right, that's about it. Um, give everyone a hand. Uh, thank you for coming and supporting this. Uh, I believe there is a break and then potentially a like town hall style session. I think all of the panelists are going to be at if you have other questions and then everyone can go start drinking. <laughs>